Okay, so I think we can we can start now. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today's seminar. My name is David Rodriguez. I'm a systems engineer here at ESpace. And um, today I have the pleasure of introducing you this new, uh, very interesting talk uh, that will be given by EPFL professor Jan Paul Kneip. Um, uh, if, I, if I were to read uh, everything Jan Paul has done in his career, I'll be here all day, so I'm gonna try to keep it short. Um, so he is a, the um, uh, head of the Laboratory of Astrophysics and the academic director of ESpace, aka my boss. He has worked as a support astronomer at the European Southern Observatory in Chile. He has also conducted research in gravitational lensing and cosmology in Cambridge, UK, Toulouse, Caltech, and Marseille before coming to EPFL as an ERC advanced grantee. He has worked on and um, participated in so many space projects that's overwhelming just looking at the list of acronyms in front of me. So I'm, I'm gonna skip that part. And he's currently involved as co-lead of the Strong Lensing Working Group of the ESA Euclid Space Mission. He's a member of the ESA Astronomy Working Group and of the Hubble Space Telescope User Committee. Uh, he currently serves on, on XMM Newton, Hubble and James Webb Space Telescope Time Allocation Committees. And in the midst of all this, he's also building a beautiful house in the Alps. And as far as I'm concerned, he might have invented time travel because it's otherwise impossible to accomplish so much in the same 24 hours I have. And if all this wasn't enough today, he will introduce us to, this, um, uh, to his involvement with the uh, Square Kilometer Array Observatory Organization. So before we start, as always, please keep your uh, mics muted and your uh, cameras off. Uh, the video stream is being recorded and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel afterwards. Uh, there will be time for a Q&A at the end uh, of this presentation. So you have two options, either you post it in the chat and I will read it afterwards, or you can raise your virtual hand and you will have a chance to ask your questions directly. So um, that being said, uh, thank you everyone again for being here and thank you, Jean Paul, for uh, making the time to speak today. Uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you, David. Um... Yeah, so it's a pleasure to be here and uh, I will present a bit of uh, the SK Observatory and the Universal Radio Wavelengths. It's, it's a really a collective work of many, many, many people. So, um, you know, uh, it's not just me, but <laughs> many scientists and, and uh, engineers that um, make this uh, project possible. And I want to acknowledge that and their contribution. So here, what I want to say in a nutshell, you know, it's what's uh, the square kilometer array observatory, what it is. Uh, I put forward a list of keywords. I don't want to explain each of them, but uh, these, you know, many of them are being behind this project. Uh, and I will try to give a flavor of uh, what the project is. So to start with, uh, we need to explain what is SKO. Uh, and as February 4, 2021, it's uh, an international uh, organization. And that means it's an organization that works through a treaty and has you know, special status worldwide. Um, and Switzerland is, uh, has just shown recently um, uh, no later than January uh, this year at its eighth member. And um, we'll see a little bit later, you know, who are the members. Um, and effectively the project really started construction uh, July 1st, 2021. So this is really a, a, a very important project for radio astronomy and astronomy in general. And it's really, as something that will behind what's uh, currently uh, available in terms of radio astronomy. Uh, and it, so it's very, very ambitious. Uh, the way it's, it has proceeded, uh, this ID started about 30 years ago. There was the first papers mentioning the square kilometer area and what we could do in the future with it. And of course, big project needs time to mature uh, and this one took 30 years and uh, in the coming seven, eight years, uh, it will be working hopefully uh, in two places, in two locations, one in Austria, and that's the picture you see over here, uh, where we have a small antennas, uh, effectively 130,000 of them over 70, 65 kilometer. Uh, spread in the western part of uh, Austria, here over here. 
uh, and basically working at low frequency. And then we have the mid-band um, antennas, uh, which are basically 15 meter dishes uh, spread across 150 kilometers. And that's basically will um, increase what is uh, currently uh, called the Meerkat uh, telescope area. The project is led by UK and they have the, the headquarter is at Jodderbank. It's a place where there is a 60 meter diameter telescope, um, 60 meter in one just strikes a big structure. Uh, and the plan for construction will last about eight years and the estimated cost today is about 2 billion euros uh, for the next 10 years. So who's part of the project? Uh, basically, that's those country uh, in blue. Um, and what you see also, there are partner countries in, in dark blue in, in Africa. Uh, because at some point, the idea is to multiply by 10 the number of antennas. And in this case, uh, those country in dark blue will host some of the antennas uh, of the South, um, South Africa area. So you see the different um, uh, flags of the different countries. Uh, the one with the dark asterisk are the, the funding members. Uh, we recently joined uh, as early this year. And in green are the next country that will be joining the project. And in orange, the ones will follow uh, hopefully uh, just after. So it's really an international project with many different partners. Uh, and, uh, and that means also a bit of complexity in terms of uh, putting things together. So why we are interested to look in, in radio? Um, when we look at the universe, we basically look at photons that are traveling through the universe uh, up to us. Um, but of course, between us and the universe, um, there are the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is blocking um, some uh, photons, and in particular, for example, the X-ray and UV light uh, are blocked uh, by the atmosphere, and, and thanks to that, uh, we can live on Earth. Uh, but there's a number of windows uh, you can uh, observe the universe um, based on, on Earth. I mean, there's the optical window uh, that we use uh, with our eyes, but if you go to radio wavelengths, uh, there's a big window where you can easily look at the universe. Uh, the complexity is that uh, the wavelengths at which you're looking at, uh, it's relatively large. Uh, we're talking about centimeter to meter wavelengths. And that means you have a special um, antenna to use uh, to look at these wavelengths. Um, and, and to make an image also, you need to use what we call interferometry. That I uh, will explain a little bit more. Here is the disk structure um, of the antenna that will be used by, uh, um, by SKA. Uh, it's a kind of a sister model of the current Meerkat antenna. Uh, that is already in place. Uh, Meerkat is composed of 64 antenna. And so we'll be adding about 130 antennas uh, to make an array of about 200 antenna. And this array will work at uh, 0.8 to 25 megahertz. In uh, Western Australia, it will be the low array and uh, we'll be using this type of antennas. Uh, so. Uh, those has been prototyped, but yet not installed um, in uh, Western Australia, or at least not in uh, big numbers. Uh, it's typically uh, a rack antenna of two meter size, and it will work between 50 and 80, uh, 800 megahertz. Uh, the distribution of this antenna underground uh, will follow some uh, spiral structure, uh, like a galaxy uh, with three arms. Uh, and uh, here you see the mid configuration in South Africa, and here you see the low configuration in Western Australia. Or, or Western Austria. For the, the low antennas, uh, to make an antenna, it's basically we will be working with uh, stations. Uh, each uh, uh, small station will have 256 antenna, and there will be 512 stations. 
for the mid antenna, there will be about 200 of these, uh, you know, 50 meter size antennas. So why we are building such a facility? Well, we want to observe the sky with a greater sensitivity. And here is a simple comparison of the sensitivity of the SK um, facility as a function of frequency. And as you see, there's SK low and SK mid. And if you compare to other facilities that are already running in radio astronomy, uh, you see that the point source sensitivity is between four and 20 times uh, the state of the art of the other facilities. SK project will uh, be done in two steps. Uh, first step is the blue line, and there's a plan to go on the second step, SK2, uh, as the magenta line. And this is another factor of 10 in terms of sensitivity which more or less uh, means a factor of tens in number of antennas. So imagine uh, in the future, uh, the idea would be to populate, for example, in South Africa, having not 200 antennas, but about 2000 antennas. And these will be uh, dispersed over uh, all the Southern part of Africa. What is also very important when you do astronomy is what we call the survey speed. And the survey speed is basically uh, the product of the sensitivity times the field of view of your um, detector, of your telescope. And the field of view of, um, uh, that has been you know, designed for SKA, it's about 10 times uh, larger uh, than uh, other facilities. So that means the survey speed in comparison to previous facility is something between 10 to 100 times uh, the state of the art. So that really tells you, you know, that facility will gonna change uh, the way we're gonna see the universe. And that's a very quick and simple uh, representation of what will be possible is like in just like a very short observation, maybe a couple of uh, uh, tens of minutes, uh, instead of uh, you know looking at you know here in particular a galaxy, and that's basically what you can do today with uh, with the VLA, with the, which is a, a, a radio telescope in uh, in New Mexico, um, and the comparison with the exact same time of observation that you can achieve with SK uh, mid. So you see the degree of improvement in the sensitivity and in the quality of the image. But in achieving that, uh, it means also you have to deal with lots more data. And that means also we, you have to work with uh, making a uh, new faster algorithm to deal with your data. Uh, but I'll, I'll explain that a bit later. Um, this is a quick schematic of all things working. We have the SK Observatory, which is this international structure uh, with global equator in the UK and with one part in Australia, one part in South Africa. And, and you know, most of uh, data will be processed there in, uh, in respective country, but at some point the data will flow in what we call the SK Regional Center, which are an international entity yet to be uh, put in place and where basically users will uh, deal with the data produced by uh, the SK Observatory. So recently uh, we had a Swiss SK meeting. We have a Swiss SK meeting every year now for a couple of years uh, since uh, 2016. And I asked Katrin Tezaski, who's the chair of the SK Council, you know, why she was ex excited by this project. And um, her four bullet points she produces the following. I mean, uh, uh, looking at uh, the universe with SK, will allow to you know, solve the Hubble constant controversy, which is basically the measurement of the expansion of the universe uh, to basically a very high precision. Uh, it will help map dark matter and dark energy in the universe uh, you know, in, 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 in collaboration with other facilities like LSST Euclid. Um, and it will also, and that's key things uh, that only SK can do uh, is look at what we call the epoch of ionization. So basically mapping the hydrogen very early in the universe. Another key aspect of SKO is basically the measurement of the magnetic field strains 
and direction at various scales. Uh, and you can basically only do that in radio. So magnetic field is something present in the universe, but up to now, uh, we have very little information. And so uh, SK will uh, allow us to do that. As some teaser, I show some of the recent observations uh, in, um, uh, in radio astronomy. And essentially, those uh, pictures are coming from the Meerkat uh, telescope, uh, which is uh, probably up to now the, the best facility uh, that, uh, that can be uh, used, at least at mid uh, at, you know, gigahertz wavelengths. And here, what we see is the center of the Milky Way. So at the center of the Milky Way, we have a massive uh, black hole, uh, which is basically behind this uh, yellow region. But what you see is also plenty of various activities, uh, like those bubbles are uh, uh, remains of uh, explosion of stars. And we also see these very uh, long features uh, that are uh, understood to be uh, linked to magnetic field. Uh, and we're just starting to understand uh, what they are. Um, and really, Meerkat and, uh, and, future, uh, and in the future, SKU will allow us to understand exactly what are those features and what they mean. What typically you see when you go a bit beyond the Milky Way um, in radio is radio galaxies. And uh, radio galaxy here is a picture of a nearby radio galaxy. Uh, Centuries A, which is uh, one of the classical radio galaxy. Um, you see, you know, the stars and, you know, in, in the optical image, you also see the stars of, of that galaxy with the dust also coming from the optical image. But the plume here that you see over here comes from the radio data. And this is basically what you see is plasma uh, that is uh, ionized by uh, the jets uh, coming out from the, um, uh, the, the, the supermassive black holes uh, that are ionizing the medium. And, and those features, uh, the radio lobes, as we call them, is something you can see very easy in, in radio. And that's one example of uh, these radio galaxy. And um, this is uh, quite an interesting one with a kind of uh, very rich shape. Uh, we call it the X-shaped radio galaxies. And, and, and the way, I mean, uh, the fact that you see is as a mixed shape is also uh, uh, will depend on you know, what is the medium around the galaxies. So the galaxies here, you have a, a black hole at the center, and you, you have jets going, uh, uh, you know, moving uh, high energetic uh, particles, producing plasma around and ionizing the medium around the galaxy. I mean, the radio galaxy are, you know, uh, can be found anywhere in the universe. And, and some are very uh, striking as a, a nice, making nice picture. And that's uh, one, radio galaxy that was serendipitously discovered by Nearcat, uh, which has a, a very interesting features um, uh, that are you know, not easy to interpret, uh, but will tell us a lot about uh, galaxy formation and evolution. This is the deep two field. It's a very deep observation of the universe made by the Meerkat area that you see uh, in, in the bottom. And, what is changing now in radio astronomy is that we're getting many, many uh, objects detected uh, with the new facility, and that would be even you know, more with SK. Um, and so there's plenty of objects you're going to observe. Many of them are more distant than any object you can find with, uh, uh, with visible um, observations. So this is very complementary to observation you do with a normal telescope. So in short, uh, here are some key science topic that will be enabled by SKO. Um, and I just list the most important. Um, the first one is the cradle of light, uh, which is a way uh, 
to explain plane formation. Uh, there's a lot of astrochemistry uh, you can do with uh, uh, at um, high uh, frequency uh, because you're able to um, detect you know very complex uh, molecules. Uh, you can uh, look for pulsars uh, and use pulsars as a way to detect gravitational waves. And this is a completely new regime, and that will uh, promise uh, very interesting discoveries. Uh, as I mentioned before, the importance of cosmic magnetism. Uh, also mentioned already galaxy formation, because we are going to be able to map the hydrogen throughout the entire universe, which is something which is hardly and very difficult to do uh, today. And that means also, because you're going to probe the entire universe, you can answer questions about cosmology. And for example, um, measurement, the baryonic acoustic oscillation, which is a good measure of the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. And uh, very importantly, also, you'll be able to measure hydrogen at the epoch of ionization, uh, at the epoch of cosmic dawn and dark ages. That means between in, in during the first giga years, the first giga year of the universe. So this is just a few pictures uh, to just uh, uh, say in what I've uh, mentioned as a list uh, with some numbers. Um, here is a, a plot where you see the distribution of uh, dust size as a function of their size. And that's the various limits uh, that uh, uh, is possible with um, you know, current telescope, ALMA and GVLA, and what will be available with SKA, or also to uh, look at, uh, you know, very close by uh, at the distance at which you can see, for example, the ice line of the heat transition in, in the exoplanetary system. So you can do a lot. Uh, you can also find the pulsars in the Milky Way, and finding the pulsars allow you to measure gravitational waves uh, that would go through the inter uh, size of our Milky Way. And so uh, the pulsar will be a way uh, to, to see gravitational waves going through the Milky Way. So that's uh, also uh, very important. Um, and that means also we're gonna see the total population of two star or pulsars in our Milky Way, uh, which is also very interesting in terms of uh, stellar evolution. As I mentioned, um, the very early uh, epoch of ionization, cosmic dawn and dark ages, this is corresponding to the time uh, after the Big Bang and basically up to 1 billion of years where there's no, um, no visible stars or galaxy today, maybe uh, a glimpse of this uh, time will be done with JWST looking at uh, infrared wavelengths, but looking at the hydrogen content, uh, that's something you can only do uh, with a radio telescope. So we have this big organization, uh, there's uh, one observatory, uh, it will work at one observatory, and uh, we'll, you know, scientists, we can uh, apply for time. Um, they can apply for SKLO or for SKMID. Uh, there will be a dedicated science program. And, and ultimately, the data will, be, will become public uh, through this regional center. What is important to realize is that the data uh, produced by uh, this uh, facility uh, is, is really uh, impressive. Uh, SKLO, uh, the flow of data uh, just at the antenna output, it's of the order of two petabytes per second, which you quickly comp compress um, uh, to seven terabytes per second. Uh, then you put that into the, what we call the correlator, uh, and then to uh, the science uh, data processor. And uh, the data that will be ingested uh, to the regional center and that will be used um, by uh, the user, by the scientist, 
uh, will be of the order of 100 gigabyte per second, which means about 600 petabyte of data yearly once the telescope uh, is, uh, is up and running. We have similar number for the SKMID. Um, and that means uh, this regional center, which is still a structure to be uh, built and imagined, uh, will be the place where users and scientists will be working of the data because the data flow is so big uh, that basically you cannot run your software on, on, on a small computer on your laptop. Uh, let me just skip that. The, uh, the regional center capability uh, uh, will be multiple. Uh, you need to you know, define a, a number of uh, system um, because uh, the data uh, will be probably distributed in different nodes and different computers. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of work in preparation and in the future to define these regional center capabilities. And, um, and uh, you know, different items are important. The science enabling application, the data discovery, because uh, there will be so much data that you have to develop tools to find you know, um, new discovery or to look at the particular object you're interested. Um, there will be need to support the science committee to uh, help them to interact with data a lot of data management, uh, interoperability, uh, because uh, you have Ethernet uh, data, uh, and also a big uh, work on visualization. So this is uh, still work to be done and, uh, in, uh, in definition uh, over this year. Um, the regional center will not come soon. Uh, at the moment, and it's just working on the functionalities. Uh, I think the most of the work will be done in terms of definition by 2025, uh, and we're starting some capacity, uh, but everything should be ready by 2030, where the infrastructure will be uh, fully uh, producing data. To be ready, we need to, to get ready. And so there's a number of data challenges uh, that have been uh, organized already. There's two of them. Uh, and there's a couple of uh, new data challenges uh, that will be uh, planned in the coming years. And the most recent one is the Science Data Challenge 2, where basically uh, the goal was to find in the cube of data, uh, which of the uh, one terabyte in size, which correspond to about 2,000 hours of uh, uh, observation um, to find object in, in, in this uh, data cube. So there's been a, a lot of uh, people uh, working on these data cubes, uh, 80 institutions from 23 countries. Um, there's been a, a lot of uh, um, node hours uh, worked on making these, these challenges. Um, about 25 terabytes of data were distributed. Um, one of the data center where the work has been conducted, the CSES is um, our national supercomputer center in, in Switzerland, where there was all the computer centers involved. And there was, of course, uh, some uh, winners. Uh, and uh, here is the leader board and the uh, the, the group at EPFL ranked six among uh, you know, many uh, uh, groups. Um, and interestingly, you know, the top three groups were really people that have been working for uh, years in radio astronomy. So uh, being you know, number six in this uh, competition was uh, quite uh, impressive already uh, because we started like uh, you know, six months uh, before the the data challenge uh, working uh, working on, on, on this, this type of data. So let me say a little bit word of uh, SKO project in Switzerland and, and give you some uh, you know, dates. Uh, we become uh, uh, connected to the project back uh, five years ago or so in October 2020. 2016, Switzerland has uh, joined 
uh, the project as an observer. Uh, so that means um, uh, the government was invited uh, to understand what was the project and also scientists uh, were getting connected to the various working groups uh, of the project uh, to you know, understand the scope and trying to, to bring their knowledge to this project. In March 2019, there was a signature of the treaty creating the SKO International Governmental Organization. In April 2020, EPFL joined SKA as leading off of Switzerland. In February 2021, SKA will start to exist as an IGO. And in June 2021, EPFL became a member of uh, this new organization. And just recently, as I say before, in January this year, Switzerland joined SKO as its eighth full member. Um, so we're really among uh, you know, the, the first country joining the, the project. Um, there's basically eight other countries that are interested uh, to join and, uh, and hopefully will join soon to make this project happen. Uh, there's a number of uh, university in Switzerland uh, that are basically part of this uh, Swiss initiative to join the project. And, uh, here is a map of, uh, of, of them. Um, and so we have you know, the, the, the two uh, ETH uh, domain university. Uh, we have the uh, University of Zurich, Bern, uh, Geneva, uh, Basel um, as cantonal university. And we have a number of technical universities, uh, FH, Net, W, Zao, uh, HSSO uh, that are part of uh, this consortium, uh, as well as the Super uh, Computing Center of, of uh, Switzerland in Lugano. So what are the Swiss involvement about uh, SKO in radio astronomy? Uh, ETHC, University of, G of Geneva and EPFL are participating to another project, which is called IRAX. Uh, and this is started in 2018 with uh, SNF funding and uh, this is a, a picture, a mock picture, this is not reality, uh, of the IRAC project and uh, where you see 1006 meter antenna uh, with a very um, precise goal to detect uh, hydrogen between redshift uh, one and, and three typically um, and measure the expansion of the universe in, in radio. Um, we have uh, funding also from uh, uh, SNF Synergia, uh, which is called Astro Signal, uh, which is both um, linked to astronomy and signal processing, uh, and which basically is, uh, is to measure the radio astronomy community in Switzerland uh, to back up the SKO project. There's been also uh, funding by the SERI, by the government, um, to help support SKO um, work. And there's been also recently uh, in the past years uh, worked uh, with South Africa and EPFL to uh, produce uh, two MOOCs on Radio Sky. And there's part one published in 2020 and part two in 2021. And uh, you can access uh, this uh, MOOC uh, on the EDX platform. So for students, uh, that might be uh, very interesting. I won't go into uh, detailed description here of uh, the work in Switzerland, but just to say that we have a Swiss SK consortium and it would be basically um, funded by uh, the government and by SNF. And it will be doing science, it will be doing outreach, uh, it will be participating into the construction of SKO and also in the, in the computing sign, basically planning the regional center I was mentioning. So there's uh, quite a lot of activities uh, on the SKO project at EPFL. And here just some uh, uh, list of you know, work activities and uh, the connection to um, uh, many uh, activities um, that are, you know, Work, been working at EPFL. So if you're interested in any of these keywords, uh, please come to me and uh, certainly we, if you want to help out with this project, there, there will be something to, to be done. So the, the last part of my presentation, um, it's about uh, the connection between radio astronomy observation and 5G 
a satellite constellation. And um, the initiative also uh, that is called the Dark and Quiet Sky uh, at the Copus. Uh, so let me introduce uh, this topic. So when you have a satellite, uh, you know, a telecom satellite uh, orbiting the Earth, uh, it constantly basically beam uh, some uh, radio uh, signal to the Earth because you know there, there is communication between Earth and satellites, um, and that's for good reason, of course. But for radio astronomy, that means uh, it's some you know interference or noise that is added to your observation. So the increase of telecom satellites means there's more RFI, you know, these radio frequency interference, more noise uh, that you need to subtract to your data. And, you know, up to now, it was not much of, of a concern. Mostly, most telecom satellites were in geo orbit. So they were always located at the same place um, with very, you know, a simple frequency pattern, et cetera. Uh, things are changing now with these 5G internet constellation that are being planned, and those uh, constellation uh, will be uh, on low orbits, uh, low Earth orbit, and they aim to cover every place on Earth. Uh, and because they're at uh, you know low altitude, and they're using wideband frequency communications, they may you know be a bigger uh, nuisance uh, to uh, SKO and radio observers. But mitigation is possible, uh, but this needs communication and respective understanding of both the astro and sat telecom uh, communities uh, so that they understand requirements and, uh, and respective needs. So in view of that, there's been uh, some work at the UN Copius. Uh, Copius is the the use of space uh, in a in peaceful, peaceful way. And, uh, and there's been recently a paper on dark and quiet skies, uh, trying to raise the issues uh, that, uh, you know, satellite communication may, uh, you know, limit some of uh, the radio uh, astronomy observation for the future. And because we are now building, you know, a facility that is uh, even more sensitive than previous uh, telescope, you know, in, any noise, any uh, you know, supplemental radio noise uh, is an issue. So the dark and quiet skies at the UNX Copus, it's not new. It's been discuss discussed, uh, you know, uh, from uh, quite a bit already, uh, a couple of years, uh, started in 2017. Uh, and there's been a recent uh, session uh, just last month uh, trying to raise awareness of, of the problem. Um, well, you say, well, satellite has been, you know, up uh, on orbits, uh, you know, for a long time already. Um, but what is changing is the rapid growth of uh, exponential growth of the number of satellites as a function of time. And what you see uh, in this plot is uh, different numbers. Uh, you see the Starlink uh, 5G internet constellation, uh, which are basically almost doubling uh, the number of active satellite. satellite. Um, and of course, uh, we have another problem, which is uh, the debris satellites. But of course, those ones, if they're not active, they will not produce radio waves. So, in, in some sort, uh, there's less of a constraint for radio astronomy. Uh, but basically the, the satellite in red and in blue here are problematic. Here is a sketch of you know, how many satellites would be visible at the location uh, of uh, the Meerkat, well, the SK South Africa uh, location. Uh, in blue uh, is the position on the sky in terms of azimut and elevation. Uh, for uh, the, the geo uh, constellation. Uh, but what you see, uh, the other points uh, are the position of all the other satellites in Leo orbits. And you see, um, there's a lot of activities uh, uh, on the, you know, uh, at high elevation, uh, which, you know, was not uh, present before because basically all, all these points are kind of new. Or will be new. 
as we're talking of more than 5,000 satellites above horizon by 2030. So it's quite, quite a big change. Um, and, and why it impacts radio astronomy? Well, radio observation uh, for astronomy are basically using you know, wideband uh, observation. Uh, so observation at any wavelength, any frequency. Um, there's been, uh, you know, some allocation, for example, you know, satellites, they have to work in specific uh, frequency. Uh, and so you see uh, some of them here that has been registered at the ITU. Um, but of course, the more you have uh, satellites, the more, uh, you know, uh, population of, of these uh, allocation, uh, basically, they will grow with time. So, that means also when you do the observation uh, that will you know conflict uh, with your wideband observation uh, at radio wavelengths and this is a, a more particular uh, feature of what we call the band 5 here uh, for the scale mid uh, and and you see that uh, you know a fair fraction of the the band 5d uh, will be used by a satellite don't link uh, so that's that's really not something you know uh, which uh, will will basically uh, you know we will you will not be sensitive to. I mean, uh, SKO will have to do uh, and to deal with uh, this added noise. Um, and of course, when you operate in low Earth orbit, you will you know go over uh, the the radio quiet zone that has been limited. Uh, in South Africa. So for example, you know, people living in this uh, region near uh, the radio telescope, they have to live without cell phones um, because, you know, uh, the, the South African government has basically banned any uh, cell phones in, the, in this region. But still, you know, uh, the, the 5G satellite constellation, they will go over this uh, quiet zone. So, uh, we could try to mitigate that by, you know, beaming uh, the, the 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 5G internet uh, constellation and not looking, not beaming directly to the to the telescope, but uh, uh, beaming on on the side. So there's a lot of discussion going on between you know Starlink and SKO uh, these days uh, to limit uh, the the noise, basically. Um, I won't go into detail here. Uh, of course, uh, it will impact radio astronomy. And there's a, a few things uh, that will be impacted. Uh, satellites also uh, impact optical and infrared astronomy, uh, although this is probably um, more easy to mitigate. Uh, but uh, for radio astronomy, the, the work is, is, I mean, the mitigation will be a bit more complex. So there's been you know, discussion going on with industry uh, with the idea of lowering back brightness, reduced visibility, uh, also providing high accuracy uh, positioning of the satellites. Uh, because if you know uh, that you have satellites passing above you at what time uh, and you know, producing what kind of emission, then you can mitigate it. Uh, so information knowledge flow is very important. Um, and also you could try to minimize the electromagnetic disturbance and spurious emission uh, if you comply with uh, the ITU limits, which, uh, which is not always followed. Um, so hopefully this will be, you know, improve the situation. Um, and certainly that's something I'm looking forward is that uh, this guidance uh, could also be implemented in the space sustainability rating that uh, is space is, is leading. Uh, so there will be um, more work uh, to be done here, um, but that's clearly something that uh, we at EPFL should uh, try to, to develop in the near future. So this is the end of my presentation. I'm sorry to, to, to speak uh, a lot here, but um, here is the takeaway. So what you have to know is SKO is the new international organization dealing with astronomy and its facility with revolutionized the understanding of our universe. Um, this is a big project. We're talking about 2 million plus euros for the next 10 years with uh, 
uh, with even more ambitious uh, future development, as I mentioned, a factor of 10 in terms of sensitivity and number of antennas uh, in the long term. And it will certainly operate for uh, the next 50 plus years um, before we manage to put uh, an interferometry on the other side of the moon, maybe. Um, but of course, you know, uh, there is some concern regarding possible impact of the 5G internet constellation. And I think uh, people have to work together to, to minimize uh, this aspect, but still, you know, allow people to benefit from the 5G internet constellation. Okay, I will stop here and we'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Paul. I think that everyone is uh, saying thank you in the uh, in the chat. So everyone enjoyed that presentation. And I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to go ahead and read some of the questions we have already in the chat. Um, so the first question we have is uh, what uh, data processing resources at EPFL or in the ETH domain will be used to deal with uh, SKO data? So the, the plan we have is to use the CSES uh, national facility uh, to deal with uh, SKO data. Uh, so we, we have a, you know, an allocation dedicated for us for SKO uh, work at CSES. Uh, at the moment it's a relatively small allocation, but the ISD in the future is that CSES become one of um, the regional center in Europe. Um, it's most likely that the regional center in Europe will be distributed in the sense it will be made of uh, different uh, super, uh, uh, super computing uh, HPC center in Europe. And, and the goal is that CS is, is you know, one of them. Um, there will be other uh, regional center in, in the various continent, one in, the, in uh, America, one in China, one in India, uh, one in Austria, one in North in South Africa, uh, but those those structure still need to be developed and uh, and and designed. Uh, but by having this uh, you know this facility already today, we can help the Swiss community to deal with the data. And the idea is to work with uh, precursor data like the Meerkat data uh, to get ready. Cool. Um... I hope that answers that question. Um, there is a, another question about um, uh, whether or if the SKIO will benefit uh, from additional antenna raised based in Europe, if this isn't already the case. Um, it's not planned at the moment. I think it could be something uh, to be imagined in the future, but probably not before the, the next 10 years. And maybe related to that also, if the if all other already existing radio observatories is still uh, complement the, uh, or can complement the SKIO. Yes, I mean, uh, that's particularly the true for uh, Austria and, and South Africa. Uh, as I mentioned already, Meerkat uh, in South Africa is made of 64 dishes and it will be part effectively of SKIO. So at some point, maybe in five years from now, uh, the Meerkat infrastructure uh, will be uh, basically given to the SKO uh, project uh, to be run as, as part of the SKO uh, interferometry in South Africa. And, and similarly in, in Western Austria, although it's probably on a, a smaller scale. That is the facility right. currently in Western Austria is not as big as, as the one in South Africa. Okay, there is a there is another question a bit more maybe technical. Um, what is what is the decision, uh, or why the decision for the final shape of the steerable dish, the SKA mead? Uh, what is the advantage compared to normal parabolic dishes or of, uh, similar configurations? Well, the the idea was effectively to minimize um, noise, um, and basically the the, the chosen design was to minimize noise coming from the, you know, from the ground. Uh, and so that's why you have this uh, particular uh, shape uh, of the antenna. Uh, let me just uh, show it again. Uh, right. Um, so, it's, so you see, right? You see my, my slides? Yeah. Okay, so, so you, basically this is kind of a parabola uh, shape. 
and it's off axis. Uh, so photons from the sky come over here, hit uh, the antenna and reflected to, to this uh, secondary antenna and uh, then to the platform where you have the, your receivers. So basically your receiver are looking uh, to, to, to the, um, to the sub-reflector, but of course you, you have possible noise coming from the sky, but, but not from the ground in, in, in this situation because your, uh, your instruments are looking up, right? Uh, and, and for example, if you look uh, when your antenna is on this position, uh, again, uh, having this uh, offset position uh, on this way and not, for example, on the top, uh, will uh, allow to minimize uh, the noise coming from the ground. So nice, I'll interesting. Make it clear. <laughs> yep. Um, so, uh, okay, we have we have, I have two more questions, uh, and then we still have five minutes, so we can we can go um, over them. Uh, there are multiple new radio observatory projects around the world. What is your opinion on utilizing them in the future? Um, you know, what should we target and how we can achieve or surpass something like EHT again? Yes, so the EHT is working at the different frequency. Uh, the Event Horizon Telescope uh, is working basically at millimeter wavelengths. Uh, and that means if I go back to my cartoon diagram here, uh, the, the EHT is basically working in these um, windows uh, where there are some, you know, um, uh, some absorption by, by, by the atmosphere, but not so much, uh, as uh, SKO is working at longer wavelengths. So this is not really in competition, it's very complementary. Uh, and, uh, and certainly uh, there will be very uh, strong interest uh, to connect uh, at higher frequency uh, the SKO antennas and other uh, antennas uh, throughout the world to do what we call the VLBI, uh, so very long baseline uh, radio observation uh, at centimeter or meter wavelengths. So certainly that's something uh, will be you know uh, done, but first we need to, <laughs> to build the, the, the dishes of SK. Sure. But, and yeah, go ahead. Sorry. But but yeah, I mean uh, because it's it's very different frequency. I mean things are. are you know, cannot always connect. So you, you can connect observatory with working at, at similar frequency, but uh, if it's different, then, then, then you have to match the frequency observation. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, the, the last question I have, uh, which is something that you already maybe hinted at the end, uh, and it says, well, this might be a bit personal, but what do you think about ex the uh, extremely large lunar far side telescope? Yeah, so one, one thing, uh, that cannot be known on Earth, and that's also shown kind of in this picture, is that at about 30 megahertz, uh, you're basically blocked by, by, by the atmosphere. Uh, if you are looking up, uh, you know, in kilohertz uh, regime, for example, uh, you, you cannot go much beyond the, the ionosphere because uh, this is blocking uh, signal from, from the universe. So the only place where you have a very quiet uh, environment, it's on the other side of the moon, uh, because there's a lot of emission coming from the Earth that basically partly are reflected by the ionosphere, but also partly uh, you know going away. Uh, and and if you don't want to be polluted, I mean you basically have to go on the other side of the moon uh, to be in a very quiet region, uh, and it's clearly s s some you know, some places there might be a lot of discovery uh, because this is clearly something you cannot do from the ground. So you really have to go somewhere and the best place is to be on, uh, it's on the other side of the moon. Yeah, maybe maybe add a couple zeros to the budget. Yes, yes certainly. Um, Although, you know, uh, uh, an antenna, uh, you know, um, working at this uh, frequency, um, a very low frequency. Um, this is, is not expensive. You know, mm -hmm. what is more expensive is you know bringing that antenna on, on onto the on the side of the moon. But right. the, the the antenna itself is not what uh, costs a lot. Right, right. 
Um, so the very, very last question I have, if, uh, you know, we have students or maybe scientists uh, watching this later, uh, uh, you know, on our YouTube channel or probably now here, um, if they want to get involved, if they want to know more, is there a place where they can go, who they should contact? Do you have any information on that? Like, is there a website they can access or an email? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so they, they can always contact me. Um, they can contact also the... Uh, you know the SK organization. Uh, that's there's a website which is uh, still being renewed uh, or put in place, which is sko.int, like, like international. Um, or you just uh, Google, you know, SKO te SKO telescope, and you will find it. Uh, we are putting a place in place uh, at EPFL uh, a dedicated website for SKO, but it's not yet ready. Uh, but uh, I guess soon uh, in the coming months or later, if you uh, Google SKO EPFL or SKO Switzerland, uh, you'd be redirected to, to that website. Perfect. Well, so I think that with that, we can, we can wrap it up right on time. So that was perfect. Uh, thank you, Jean-Paul. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I think it was a blast. Everyone enjoyed it and uh, see you on the next one. Yeah. Take Thank care. you, everyone. Thanks, David. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jean-Paul. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot.